Eventide Media Center, an analog horror series beginning in February of 2020 and still in its infancy, brings a unique spin to the saturated market of analog horror series. While the series itself does draw inspiration from other analog horror media dealing with similar content matter, such as Gemini Home Entertainment and Local 58, Eventide focuses on a local media center within the fictional Massachusetts region of Eventide Valley. The videos themselves vary in content, ranging from weather forecasts to movie nights. Paint a stark picture of this region, where the seemingly mundane is drenched in a foggy mist of cosmic unknowns. Let's turn off the lights, turn up the volume, and tune in to Eventide Media Center. Along with the YouTube channel, Eventide Media Center also includes an active Twitter account that posts periodically in tandem with their video uploads. This Twitter account is where the story begins. February 2nd, 2020. The Eventide Media account posts a peculiar photo with the tagline Eventide Media Center in 1969. The photo itself appears to be a run-of-the-mill media center with the Eventide Valley Media Center name engraved on the building's front. However, an eye peers down at the sidewalk, one that appears to be a bit too real. On February 20th, 2020, the first video uploaded by Eventide Media Channel introduces us to the strange world of Eventide Valley. This first installment, entitled Unusual Architecture, was created by the Fictional Architecture Association of Massachusetts. The contents of this tape deal with the creation of a theoretical Penrose shape in the real world, with strict warnings of the structure's forbidden nature in the state of Massachusetts. Part 1 of the video introduces us to the idea of impossible shapes and geometric structures, non-Euclidean and impossible to exist. These Penrose shapes, despite their defiance of natural geometry and paradoxical in nature, are apparently only made to be this way through the psyche of the individual. In order to create these shapes, we must cast away the limitations of our minds. Part 2, Impossible Shapes of Architecture, applies these impossibilities to reality. Biographies of the Penrose family and of M.C. Escher are shown to ground the subject matter in our reality, giving a sense of credibility and realism to the video. According to the creators of this video, these impossible shapes supposedly will allow humanity access to infinite energy. Part 3 Constructing an impossible shape takes the supposed impossible geometry and constructs them in this reality.
It appears that a full 3D model, rotated and viewed from all perspectives, proved to be too much for the video software to handle. Even the creation of the object is unseen. We can glean a few facts from this initial video. First, the story takes place in Massachusetts, with this video having been created through a grant provided by the Architecture Association of Massachusetts. Second, the story is set in 1989, or at least in the ballpark of the late 80s and early 90s. Third, the guiding principles of reality are breaking down in this universe. Impossible shapes, unreal geometry, are somehow possible to achieve. The barriers between the mundane and the extraordinary are dissolving and this dissolution of normality only continues. Even Ty tweeted out a photograph after the video's subsequent release, a vintage photo featuring two men with axes standing before an impossible shape. The description reads, Eventide Valley's first impossible construction. This reveals that impossible shapes have been created in the past, which begs the question, what occurred to have them banned later on? Ocean View Forecast is as it sounds, a typical nightly forecast for the surrounding regions of Eventide Valley. The ticker roll at the bottom of the screen provides information on local events and news. The Misty Point Lighthouse is open Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m a location to keep in mind for future reference. Special midnight tours are available for the abandoned Misty Point Cemetery as well. On the screen, we see an image of the Misty Point Lighthouse, and judging from the regional forecast title, implies this broadcast is coming from the fictional town. The ticker roll advises residents of Misty Point, Indigo Shoals, and Lucid Cove to take immediate shelter due to inclement weather. We are then greeted by a local radar that displays the encroaching storm. Those venturing towards the coast should be cautious. The ticker roll below scrolls quickly with a warning not to attempt to approach the Misty Point Lighthouse within a three mile radius, as if some anomalous event is occurring in the area. There's a lot to unpack in this entry. All assumptions about the dissolving barriers of reality seem to take an abstract shape in this weather forecast. A seemingly innocuous broadcast descends into Lovecraftian madness as the night rolls on. First, all those near the Misty Point Lighthouse and near the coastline of Massachusetts are advised to take shelter from an oncoming storm, which then quickly changes to an evacuation order. The ticker at the bottom relays directions and warnings. Cover all reflective objects. Do not attempt to look directly at the lighthouse, 
Avoid the path of a lavender beam of light through the fog, likely the light of the lighthouse. The mention of a lonesome, what exactly? Residents are told to avoid the gaze of the light, that a creature is arising from the sea and bringing the light of the ocean with it. This entity is using the light of the lighthouse as a focusing beam, sending out a, what exactly? Hypnotic beam, a pure beam of chaos, inducing madness in all that see it. The mention of a face, both in the storm itself and in the beam of light. And finally, we see the lighthouse covered in some sort of biological substance, an infection seeping its way into the lighthouse. A tweet was sent out three days after the Ocean View weather forecast video was posted to YouTube. The Misty Point Lighthouse, photographed in 1943. Above the familiar lighthouse is a distortion in the photograph, the familiar face seen within the forecast video, and the beam of the lighthouse light. Whatever this entity is, whatever its motivations are, it appears to have been in the eventide area for decades, if not longer. Some sort of eldritch horror hiding out at sea. Sliding back to the early 1970s, the nuclear safety video is intended to prepare residents of the Eventide Valley area for the real possibility of a nuclear strike. The video itself starts off as a fairly typical nuclear safety instructional video. Know the warning signs and signals, the procedures, the debilitating effects of a nuclear strike. However, it is at this point that the video begins to shift in tone.
Inside the flashing effect of the flash stage of a nuclear detonation is a fleshy and organic substance, one similarly seen on the lighthouse. The heat wave, the blast, and the fallout carry the video through the stages of this detonation. The photographs on Twitter, and now this video taking place further back in time, solidifies the anomalous events have been around for quite some time. From what the video states, this nuclear detonation signifies the end of life in the region, that all hope is lost, and that no amount of protection will deter the ensuing corruption, going so far as to say that there is no aftermath once the bomb strikes. The fleshy, biological substance in the flash of the detonation and in the ensuing explosion seem to signify a few possibilities. 1. The bombs themselves contain the anomalous element that when detonated, spread a mutagenic property through the radiation. And from what can be seen, this radiation can penetrate any surface and any depth and will attack and mutate an individual. 2. Instead of containing this anomalous element, the cataclysmic explosion creates a tear, a fissure, and a flash that allows some corrupting force to seep through into our reality. A flash of information pops up on screen for a fraction of a moment, relaying some additional information regarding the organization behind the video's creation. We see the Massachusetts Threat Defense Group is responsible for the video, declassifying the reel on June 1, 1971. It is also shown that this is Emergency Reel B, seeming to imply the existence of either a prior entry or that this entry is an alternate version of it. The logo of the group reveals a few possibilities, namely surrounding the triangle in the center of the logo. The triangle has historically been associated with the occult and mysticism, and we could possibly designate this triangle as a two-dimensional Penrose Triangle. A photograph posted on Twitter gives additional insight into the true nature of these nuclear detonations. Taken in 1971 at the Bikini Atoll during an unregistered test by the Massachusetts Threat Defense Group, the image shows the aftermath of a nuclear detonation, and within the detonation, a flesh-like web substance and tendrils spilling from the top of the mushroom cloud. This image again begs the question, is this an entry point for this entity, or is the bomb itself Anomalous in nature. Firmly set in the 1980s, this video acts as a sign-off card that transitions into a new block of programming entitled Deep Night Programming. A bulletin fills the screen, displaying the different programs to be aired in the near future. But for this night, likely May 24th, the programming is Tripography. Tripography is a duplicating machine that essentially uses a stylus to punch holes into paper to create intricate designs. And, as we'll soon see, this idea of punching through could have multiple meanings. Region 1. Latest capture. 3.22 AM. Location. Torrent Park. A green hue fills the screen. The camera pans, and holes punched into the earth are visible. The screen fills with Region 1 data. Quantity, approximately 15. But, 15 of what? And the growth at 2%. These holes average at 56 meters deep. Region 2. Latest capture. 3.25 AM. Location. Zenith Gardens. More holes are seen in the earth as a high trail blankets the region. 22 in quantity, growth of 14%, depth at an average of 75 meters. According to the updates, it is unknown if the Zenith and Torrent Park holes are physically linked. Region 3, latest capture, 3.25 AM. Location, East King Street. Holes litter the street. One oh seven, forty eight percent growth, 
an average depth of 156 meters. Here, the mention of organic, plant-like seed growth suggests some active species is boring these holes. Region 4, 326 AM, location, West King Playground. This particular entry feels reminiscent of Gemini Home Entertainment. Subterranean organic structures stretching meters underground in a connected fashion, infesting the local area. These stalk-like, one-eyed creatures may be the reason behind the eye on the Eventide Valley Media Center building. All around, this entry shows the media center and community's awareness of the anomalous events described in these videos. The question becomes, what are these creatures? A new photo, drenched in a green hue, in someone's front lawn, shows holes punched into the earth, two white-eyed stalks peering out at the viewer, taken just minutes after the video ends. The caption reads, A minor typography growth. And we are left with more questions than answers. This entry feels vaguely reminiscent of Local 58's Show for Children. The same low resolution black and white film aesthetic fills the screen. A dramatic composition blares as the end credit rolls. One thing to take note of is the strangely long starring section, with quite a few names being billed as actors in this 1950s film. In memoriam of those who lost their lives between December 1952 and October 1953, working under Somber Film Company. This film is dedicated to the families and friends of those deceased. And as the memoriam rolls and rolls and rolls, we see several familiar names mentioned only minutes previously. Finally, the title card appears, Attack of the Somberville Spiders. Now. While seeming to be a fictional film set in the series as reality, it appears to be almost a documentary of sorts cataloging a very real, massive spider attack in Somberville. An attack that resulted in several losses of life while the film was in production. And if we pause the video at just the right moment, we see the disclaimer change from fictional to very, very real. An ensuing Twitter post further adds to the video's content. The description reads, 
a poster for Attack of the Somberville Spiders, designed with true 50s horror camp in mind. Let's take a moment and synthesize a theory about the series so far. First, at this point, we can safely say there is no plot-based story to be told here. Unlike other series of similar quality and length, the overarching story has more to do with cataloging anomalous events as they occur in the Eventide region, rather than tell one long story. All I can provide is an analysis of each subsequent video. You might have noticed that each entry, if not an informational video, takes place in a new fictional town, with a new anomalous event, and in a different year. This still feels similar to VHS. We are simply observers, pushing in and viewing VHS tape recordings and reels of seemingly unconnected events happening throughout the years. Instead, we see separate entries, simply indulging in campy horror fun. The only continuing threads we have are subtle allusions to other entries in the series, such as the web-like organic motif and references to other happenings in this reality. However, at this point, it appears that none of these events affect the other, each its own isolated incident, unconnected, yet tied together by one singular entity, Eventide Media Center. A sentient storm of the coast of Misty Point, one night stock creatures burrowing holes in Eventide Valley, massive mutated man-eating spiders in Somberville, and, as we'll soon see, an excavating project in Old Gothsford. October 5th, 1987, Old Gothsford City Council meeting. While watching a black screen, we can hear the sounds of a city council room filled with citizens, journalists, and all those interested in city affairs. Despite the 12 chairs in total, only two of the seats are occupied. Mayor Smith begins, discussing the third quarter resource allocations. 23% for maintenance, 7 for education, 12 for industrial development, and a whopping 58 for excavation. Next, a priest Osborne of the Church of Gothsford. He relays his concerns about the ongoing excavating project, mentioning a disruption in their services, and offers a proposal which would shift the project away from the church, as well as providing compensation for the church's financial losses. His reasoning? The project goes against their lord's wishes. And, as Priest Osborne is cut off, a deep rumbling shakes the building. As the excavating project progress begins to roll on, we are shown a map of the areas affected by the excavation, showing a peculiar outline. A massive humanoid just below the city's surface. Thank 
Let's start with the overly obvious. There is some massive humanoid entity lying dormant underneath the city of Old Gothford that, at the end of the video, appears to have awakened from its dormant state and arisen from the earth, no doubt destroying most of Gothford in the process. Some massive humanoid silhouette-like entity with glowing white eyes peering at the viewer. However, let's take a moment to consider the Church of Old Gothford Judging from the priest Osborne's negative view of the excavating project, noting that the project is interfering with their services, and that their quote, Lord, disproves of the project, it appears that the church worships, excuse me, worshipped the subterranean entity. Given Osborne's mention of taking matters into his own hands, we can safely assume he roused the sleeping giant from its slumber to once again roam the earth. The ensuing Twitter posts only confirm our suspicion of Priest Osborne. We are given a better view of the image seen in the video. Outlined in indigo is a clear humanoid shape, and at the head of this colossal entity, the Church of Gothsford. The text on the photo reads, Planned excavation of West Gothsford to occur within the region marked in indigo. Those affected may be entitled to compensation. Relocation of all property assets is not guaranteed. Heavy breaths may be heard at early hours. A demo reel, released in January of 1990. This informational video details Interface Vision's advancements into the field of computer graphics. The reel is broken up into three sections, animation and visual effects, models, and character models. Animation and visual effects shows off animations quite advanced for the time period drenched in that signature 90s polygonal look. A description reads, All animations created from visions and dreams of our dedicated employees. The next section, Models, shows some computer-generated models of everyday objects. A piano, a flower, a computer and a keyboard. All with elements of computer interfacing. Finally, character models, accurately modeled after real-life participants. As the camera pans out to reveal the entire motherboard, 
elements of a real-world forest seem to be present on screen. Trees, beds, and participants viewable on this computer-generated image. Here at Interface, our visions become reality, really driving home the point of using literal dreams to create their computer-generated imagery. However, it appears that participating in such a venture has its costs, such as becoming integrated into the interface itself through some truly disturbing technological body horror. The final slide dedicates the demo reel to Madison Gatesburg, the wife of Joe Gatesburg, who most likely occupied a now empty fourth bed. Interface Studios, 10 Boarfield Drive, East Circuit, MP. A motherboard, massive and sprawling, sits on the forest floor. As the video implies, the motherboard rests in a literal forest, foggy and dense. And just out of sight, four beds awaiting participants. I'd also like to mention the addition of East Circuit, seeming to imply three other possible circuits out there all feeding into a larger, integrated network. Brought to us by the Botanical Foundation of Massachusetts and in association with Eventide Media Group, Oasis Greenhouse gives us a tour of the Eventide Valley Greenhouse. This informational video walks us through the wide variety of flora located within the greenhouse. Floral selections, highlighting beautiful flowers, tropical selections, showcasing wonderful trees and fruits, subtropical selections, revealing species of Venus flytraps, and finally, most interesting of all, the local selection. This entry reminds me of Little Shop of Horrors to an extent. The oasis, as it's called, is clearly filled with human remains, with a liquid substance created in this acidic vat being used for a wide variety of consumables, from protein bars to energy drinks. It appears the residents of the local area are consuming themselves. We have the presence of body horror-esque plants made from human organs, such as the digestive tract and human brain most likely created from organs extracted from the oasis. Also seen is a flora amalgama, an amalgamation of several different plant species and carnivorous in nature. The related post on Twitter adds to the story of the oasis greenhouse. As seen in the final shot of the video, the anomalous plant-based creatures appeared to have escaped the greenhouse. This photo, dated March 21st of 1994, shows the greenhouse shut down, overgrown, and in disrepair, with the tendrils and carnivorous head of the flora amalgama just above the glass roof. 
Video number 9 pulls back in style to the earlier entry of weather forecast. Taking place in the fictional town of Ashenfield on July 23rd, 1979. This fire danger emergency message cuts into the usual broadcast. The screen reads, fire danger for today, with a meter gauging the severity of the local fires. A brief message pops up on screen, noting that a controlled burn will be performed with the county fire department. As we switch back to the meter, the gauge slowly slides into moderate. July 24th, a controlled burn at 3.35 p.m. Open fires prohibited. The gauge slowly inches closer from moderate to high. In addition to yesterday's message appears, you too can help prevent wildfires. Visit your local fire station to learn more. Today's ceremony begins at 3 p.m. As we cut back, the meter slides into the high range. At this point, it becomes apparent the temperature of the region is climbing as well. An aerial shot of the region is shown, smoke filling the burning forest. Controlled burn currently in progress. Those not participating are required by law to seek shelter immediately. The attention to detail in this video amazes me. What starts off as a seemingly mundane Firewatch broadcast and mention of a controlled burn slowly turns to madness. The mention of a ceremony early on in the video hints towards more than just a simple controlled burn. The broadcast advises those who are not participating in this burning ceremony are required to stay inside. However, the county fire department quickly loses control of the fire becoming a high-hazard wildfire that is spreading towards Ashenfield and Grove Creek. As a helicopter pans over the burning forest, a deep rumbling can be heard as the county fire department urgently requests for any able-bodied citizen to help out. Inside the flames, we can see the victims, or possibly even sacrifices, in this burning ceremony. In the horizon, we see a colossal entity, the source of the deep rumbling and who this ceremony was meant for, either to appease or to destroy. It appears that whatever the ceremony was intended to do has failed, and participants and citizens alike are now in danger of this eldritch monstrosity and the spreading fire. On Twitter, another photo is tweeted out. The description reads, 
a wildfire prevention poster. The poster itself shows a wooden cross stuck into the ground with a fireman's helmet atop the crucifix and barbed wire around the center. Nine in 10 wildfires are caused by inactivity. You too can prevent wildfires. The entity seen in the video is visible in the hazy background, massive and imposing as it looks over the valley. The poster seems to imply that our own inactivity is what causes the wildfires to start, as if the massive entity is responsible for the death and destruction seen if the burn is not controlled. Our final entry at this time, week ahead, taking place on September 21st of 1997, on New Trilights Channel 33, shows us the coming week's events. Happening today is the grand opening of Delta Clothing and Accessories. The next slide gives us information on Delta Fashion, noting limited time grand opening deals on all department items, as well as a view of the store itself. Monday, September 22nd, 1997. The Twilight Schoolborn Meeting, Sky Park Flea Market, and the Monday Festival. This festival, beginning at 9 p.m. on Main Street, has its closing ceremonies at 10 p.m. and promptly ends at 11. Friday, September 23rd. A warning is put onto the screen. Triday events begin between 12 and 6 a.m. Residents are to remove all instances of the number three from their home and will be given the all clear by the Trilight Emergency System. As described in the end of the video, some sort of temporal and interdimensional anomaly occurs in the region on so-called Tridays. The entire town is built around the theme of threes, Trilight, a triangle in the logo, the channel number of 33, the delta symbol on the clothing store, the ceremony in which the effigy appears as a triangle, and the inclusion of Tridays. Then we have the introduction of these brightly pinkish purple temporal anomalies appearing as floating octahedrons. 
In the end, we see the price paid for not removing all instances of three from a given space. The longitude and latitude given at the end of the video places us in the middle of a Massachusetts forest. It also appears that after the events have concluded, that the entire day appears to have been skipped, with Tuesday the 24th resuming the week. Over on Twitter, Even Hyde posted yet another photograph, Triday 1983. This image, in black and white, shows a trilight neighborhood under siege by the temporal disruptions. Some form of energy, appearing as lightning, is being emitted by the octahedrons and striking nearby houses. Given the inclusion of just the year, it appears that Tridays likely only come around once every 15 years or so. Who knows why these entities attack, and why the time would include the number 3 just about everywhere, when it appears to be a very clear danger especially on these so-called Tridays. And that appears to be the entire series so far. Well, not entirely. One more video no longer exists on the Eventide Media YouTube channel, and is instead locked away in the Eventide Media archives. While I would love to show the entry, the video itself is locked behind a paywall. The series itself has a couple of other additions, however, subscribing to the creator's Patreon is the only way to view them currently. Due to this, we will not be discussing those entries or diving into that content. If you are interested in learning more about the Eventide universe, please check out their YouTube channel, Twitter, and Patreon as well for additional content. Overall, Eventide treads familiar ground with unique twists. The production value and quality of the videos are always top-notch and well-crafted. The series does an amazing job at breaking the mold, especially when it comes to the emergency broadcast subgenre. Instead of going to the usual emergency alert system, the series instead integrates the rising danger into the usual broadcast, either through weather forecasts or news slash county updates. This gives the genre a much needed breath of fresh air. It is clear though, that the channel does draw quite a bit of inspiration from series that have come before. Elements of Local 58, Gemini Home Entertainment, and even Lovecraft are easy to see in the videos. Speaking of the videos, the channel benefits from not having to stick to one cohesive story, and can instead experiment with style, with storytelling, and with its own mythos. Some other series entrap themselves in their own lore, creating inconsistencies, plot holes, and outright mistakes in their own entries that detract from the overall experience. Even Ty does not have to worry about this issue. It allows us, the viewers, to expect the unexpected to always be on our toes when it comes to a new entry, and gives the creator creative license to go wherever the mood pleases with the series. The lack of a central story also allows the series to be available to a wider audience. Some analog series suffer from being too subtle and nuanced with their storytelling, turning many off of their media. Even Tide does not have this issue, can even be an entry point into analog horror for those interested. To summarize my thoughts, Eventide is a unique take on some old themes and styles. The campy style mixed with the more serious and technically proficient videos creates a unique atmosphere I've yet to see elsewhere. Whether it be more campy horror in one video, more stylistic in another, body horror in one entry, and Lovecraftian horrors in another, I look forward to seeing what Eventide produces next. Hello everyone, Sinister Art here. Thank you for sticking around until the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed this, as I enjoyed learning about a new Analog Horror series. If you enjoyed Eventide, please consider subscribing to their YouTube channel, following them on Twitter, and if you're so inclined, check out their Patreon page as well to support the creator. If you all enjoyed this examination of Eventide Media Center, please let me know. I love to cover more Analog Horror series and ARGs in the future, and getting feedback from you all will help me know if I should cover more, or move on to other projects. If you think I should do more ARGs or horror-related content, what do you think I should do next? Once again, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.